Um, welcome to the second um, plenary session of the day. So it's a pleasure to introduce um, Lewis Mitchell, who was the 2021 awardee of the J.H. Um, Mitchell Medal. Um, he's made significant contributions to the emerging field of computational social science. He uses mathematical modeling, computational statistical techniques to assess real world phenomena. He's really had impact across a number of applications. He's collaborated with a number of groups to investigate the um, geography of happiness, the shapes of stories um, in novels in different languages, um, the effect of body image on social media and monitoring of the wildlife trade to name just a few areas that he's worked in. Um, he's taken this work and contributed to a significant number of outreach activities as well. He's been features in an installation and artwork in the Museum of Discovery in Adelaide. He's had numerous um, media pieces, um, including contributions to the conversation with um, many tens of hundreds of thousands of readers uh, since those have appeared. Um, Lewis's CV really is impressive. He's um, attracted several grants, um, published a, a number of journal articles, and I think importantly, um, pub published and worked a lot with a, a number of different um, collaborative projects and a number of different students. Um, in 2018, he was awarded the South Australia Tall Poppy Award and the ACEMS Awards for Outreach and Outstanding Achievements. So he really is a de deserving recipient of the 2021 uh, Mitchell Medal, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing his talk today on applied mathematics and data science. Over to you, Lewis. Thank you so much, um, Alice, and uh, thank you all so much for coming here and, uh, and listen to me, listening to me talk about this. This is um, this is truly an honour um, to get to do this um, for me. Um, you know, I think I made when I accepted the award last year. I made this quip. Um, that my career was peaking, you know, that getting the award was the, it was the best thing and then it was all downhill from here. Um, but this is probably better, this is, um, you know, more uh, um, you know, worthwhile and um, rewarding thing to do um, even. So maybe that was a local maxima and this is the peak and now this is the peak of the career um, and it's all going downhill. Um, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, and it's a pleasure to talk about this. So. I set myself this challenge in writing the abstract um, of, of talking at a, a sort of higher level um, about applied mathematics and data science. So, um, you know, as, um, as you just heard, I guess, um, a key feature of my career to this point has been uh, sort of working between these disciplines of applied mathematics and data science. It's, so it started squarely. Um, uh, in applied mathematics, you know, fluid mechanics, and these days, as, as I'll talk about, you know, analyze social media and social networks and do stuff that's um, some stuff that gets very squarely called um, data science. And, and this is an important time for us to have this discussion, I think, um, about uh, what the distinctions are, what the relationship is between these two disciplines. So the plan um, for today, um, I'll try and uh, I'll talk at a sort of high level um, about data science, sort of talk about what it is, um, where I think it's going, um, uh, uh, and then um, uh, I, I want to talk about then uh, later on about applied mathematics and how it is uh, complementary, uh, I think, with data science and, and what those relationships are. Um, but I want to try and just illustrate some of this with examples as well. So I don't want to just talk uh, entirely in generality. So I will tell you a little bit um, about my uh, research. So I'll tell you about some of the fun social media, um, you know, pretty squarely data science work. Um, and I'll explain why. I'm in this hedonometer project um, and the various things that we've done there. Um, and then I want to end off with an example um, that I think really um, gets at the, uh, the complementarities and the relationship between data science. Uh, and applied mathematics. And that's this work that's um, ongoing now um, on information flow in social networks. So hopefully, um, you know, if you get bored by me talking at a sort of a fairly uh, high level, uh, I guess, uh, about the relationship between these disciplines in this sort of vague sense, hopefully you'll be able to tune back in um, at some point and I'll try and show you some actual um, sciences uh, as part of this plenary. So let's start here. So, uh, so where, what, what is data science? Uh, let's start with that question. Uh, it's a it's a big question and it's an important question and something I've been thinking a lot about recently. Um, yeah, and let's and, and let's uh, talk for a few minutes about where it's come from. So, data science uh, as an emerging discipline has been around for probably about ten years, uh, maybe slightly longer. 
Um, you, you know, it really, it really came out of the tech sector. It came, came from industry um, uh, and the tech sector really in, in the US um, in the early 2010s. Um, and it exploded onto the scene um, uh, really with this article uh, in the Harvard Business Review um, where it was uh, coined awkwardly, um, I think the sexiest job um, of the 21st century. Um, so this was um, uh, uh, because you know, tech companies at the time were making uh, great insights and analyzing huge amounts of um, you know, this flood of new data that was coming from uh, it was coming from the internet and was coming from social uh, net networks and social media. Um, and yeah, and, and, and it got this moniker of being the sexiest job of the 21st century. Um, so DJ Patil here um, is an interesting character. Um, started off really as an applied mathematician. Um, uh, you know, it sort of came out of chaotic dynamics, um, you know, similar sort of background to myself and some of my mentors. Um, eventually became the White House, the chief data scientist in the Obama White House. Um, yeah, it was one of these uh, trailblazers in moving across from, uh, moving across from you know, traditional uh, sort of more mathematical disciplines into this uh, data science. So there's, you know, being called um, the sexiest job of the 21st century immediately puts a target um, on a discipline's back, uh, I think. And so, um, you know, some cynicism about data science um, came pretty quickly. Uh, you know, it's typified by this sort of, um, uh, by this sort of uh, idea, which has some truth um, uh, to it, I think, maybe, that data science and statistics done on the max, so sort of flashy statistics. Um, and, you know, there was some, uh, it was probably some justifiable um, angst from statisticians about the, the application of, you know, very old statistical techniques um, to, new data, uh, to new data sets and calling that, um, and calling that a new science. So there's this, you know, there's this question about what data science is. Is it a discipline? Do we need it? Um, and this is a discussion that's been um, happening for, um, you know, it absolutely, um, as I'm going to uh, explain, uh, talk about today, I think it is a discipline. Um, uh, and it is a, a new science and we'll talk about why. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it, like any discipline, it has been, um, uh, it's had, it, it, it's a rocky road to uh, emerging, I guess. So, um, as for what data science is, there are many different definitions and I'll talk about a few um, different ones. My favorite, uh, I think, remains this one, uh, uh, which is from, you can see in the link down here, uh, from 2013, so also you know, almost 10 years old now. Um, Drew Conway um, was uh, uh, again a tech, um, a tech sector uh, comes from the tech sector uh, in the US. But he describes data science as being at the intersection uh, of these various discipl different disciplines. So I think this is really interesting for a range of reasons. Um, so you have traditional maths and stats. So the you know, maths and stats that we all did as, uh, as undergrads. Substantive expertise here means some external domain. So the idea um, that gets said a lot about uh, data science is it doesn't produce any um, uh, data in, uh, of its own. It goes prospecting, um, if you like, for um, uh, data from other fields, from other domains, um, and then applies a range of techniques to them. And the, the value comes in really bringing these things together. So you could argue that maybe um, applied mathematics sits in the intersection here between maths and stats um, and substantive expertise, if you think of that as domain um, expertise. Um, uh, and, and then the new thing, uh, the, uh, you know, the thing that, uh, the other piece of the puzzle, hacking skills here means computer science, uh, the application uh, of, uh, of computer science techniques to be able to deal with the, you know, the volume and the veracity, uh, et cetera. Of, uh, of data and to um, apply uh, to apply um, statistical mathematical uh, techniques uh, at scale. I love the idea that uh, the danger zone, um, and I absolutely agree with this, the intersection of um, computer science uh, techniques with um, two external problems is the danger zone. Um, you know, you could read that as being the, the injudicious use of uh, machine learning techniques or something like this in the modern context. So, you know, we put um, data science at the, uh, at the center uh, of, of this Venn diagram. So some of you might be thinking, and I'm thinking as well, like if we're going to talk about data science versus applied mathematics, there's already a bit of a, uh, um, an issue here in that, you know, plenty of you in this audience will use plenty of um, computer science and, um, and simulation and uh, large scale compute 
and plenty of hacking skills uh, uh, in our professions as, as data scientists. So, you know, you could almost argue um, that modern applied mathematics um, sits in the center of this Venn diagram as well. Um, and there's, a, there's an argument to be made for that. So there's a question here, it's gonna be a question here about how we distinguish these things um, and how we relate these, uh, relate these disciplines together. But that's a, a, nice, um, a nice picture um, you know, in, uh, in a picture, not in, uh, in a formal definition um, of what data science is that I think uh, still, still holds a lot, of merit, a lot of merit now, you know, almost 10 years later. So more recently, moving forward into the um, closer to the present um, now, as data science um, uh, builds up this head of steam, um, particularly in you know, comes into academia as well as um, uh, into the, uh, in the tech sector, um, you know, David Bly, um, uh, some people will notice is the, uh, will notice the name of, um, is the inventor of latent Dirichlet uh, allocation, which is a method for topic modeling. So extracting um, information from groups of texts. Um, yeah, he's a, you know, a, a, a very a renowned academic and data scientist and machine learner. Um, this is another attempt to define data science um, in terms of what it does, uh, in terms of uh, the practice of doing it. So it's, it's not quite a formal definition, um, but I like it. It talks about um, data science as having a statistical uh, computation, computational uh, and a human element. Um, it, it talks about it from these three uh, different, uh, different viewpoints. And the words that I've highlighted in this you know, snippet um, from the text here um, should be pretty familiar to us as applied mathematicians, right? Like it talks about um, here, you know, in the statistical aspect, you know, the value and the necessity of approximation um, and simplification uh, when applying some quantitative techniques or some computational techniques um, to large unusual data sets. Um, uh, you know, there is this important aspect in, in simplifying your uh, models, be they statistical or whatever, uh, and making approximations. Um, and that's applied mathematics, right? Like that's modeling. That's what, uh, that's what we all do. Um, in the, uh, uh, it, it goes on to talk about the, the importance of communication, uh, communicating the results of a data analysis and the understanding about the world that we glean from it. And that is modeling, right? That's, a, that's familiar to me as well. Um, as, uh, as a mathematical modeler, what do we do? We look at a problem um, out in the real world. We, um, uh, we write down an appropriate uh, mathematical model um, with some simplifications and some approximations and some assumptions. We do some mathematics and then we reinterpret um, the results, the, the quantitative results that we get out of that analysis um, back in the context of the real world problem. So we try to gain some understanding from that. So this is sounding a lot like applied mathematics. Um, and then it goes on to talk about, um, you know, the relationship um, with different domains and, you know, the idea of data scientists and domain experts working together, um, you know, to um, create appropriate models with appropriate assumptions and appropriately appropriate methods. And that sounds a lot like applied mathematics. So there's a real similarity here um, between these few things. And so, you know, it's, it, we should be thinking um, the data science is, is, should have a lot of interaction with applied mathematics and there should be a lot of commonalities between the two. Okay, so that's um, a bit about data science. I wanna tell you a little bit uh, about my, i give you an example uh, of a data science project um, that I've worked on that has these statistical computational and human um, elements. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about is this um, hedonometer project that I've worked on uh, uh, with colleagues from the University of Vermont, from the Vermont Complex Systems Center, over a long time now, over you know, again, 10 years now. Um, so hedonometer.org is a website that you can go to that ingests 10% uh, of all publicly authored tweets per day. Uh, and from it, it does some magic uh, and it produces um, a daily stock ticker, daily happiness ticker uh, of the happiness uh, of the Twitter sphere based on the things that people have written. So you see that Christmas Day is a happy day, um, you know, January the 6th, uh, 2021, the storming of the US Capitol uh, was a sad day uh, on Twitter. Uh, and, you know, there's, uh, you can explore and there's a lot of interesting patterns here. Um, you can delve in a little bit further. If there's an unusual day that you find here um, that looks particularly sad, you, you want to know why that is. 
Um, you can go and look in the words that are making that day um, are relatively sad compared to uh, the days nearby. You see that this particular day, which is in uh, August 2020, uh, was the day of a protest of shooting in, um, uh, in Wisconsin. So people talk about gun violence and things like this more on that day. Um, there's a few other uh, things going on. You see hurricanes are being talked about there. Um, and you know, um, this stuff pushes out people's ability to talk about exams. So people have, uh, must be talking about exams uh, on Twitter at the time. I guess it's that time of year uh, in the US and that goes down because you know, we can only talk about so many things um, at once. So how do we do this? So let's talk about the statistical aspects of this data science product. So the, the fundamental data here, the data that's been uh, looked at um, is words. So essentially um, uh, the way that this study works is we built up a dictionary um, of the scores of words. So we ask people to uh, rate words on a scale from one to nine based on how happy or sad they are. So laughter and Christmas are happy words, terrorist and cancer are sad words, uh, you know, stop words are, are in the middle. You'll be happy to know that mathematics is slightly above average. That's a good news story for us once you get a few, um, once you get a, a few ratings. And then what we do, the statistical aspects of this tool, the machine learning magic underneath the hood um, is so naively simple that it's not funny. Um, for a large collection of text, you take all of the words that are on the day, uh, written on a day, you look up their scores, right? They all have these happiness scores, and then we calculate the average. <laughs> we calculate the first moment uh, of this distribution of language that's been written uh, with respect to these, uh, these word scores. So this is just a way of writing the mean. So the statistics here um, is super simple, right? We're doing the simplest possible statistics you could ever um, uh, you could ever imagine. So, but there is a statistical aspect. So next come the computational aspects. Um, and there is an awful lot of computation that has to go on underneath the hood here. Uh, I don't want you to look at um, any of the writing here. Just know that this is um, a tweet. Um, so when we receive uh, one tweet um, from the Twitter API, a publicly um, authored uh, tweet, you don't just get the you know, 280 characters, 140 characters of text um, that we think of as being a tweet, you get all this other information as well. So I always say if there's one thing that people take from these talks that I give about this stuff, just know that when you post on Twitter, this is what you're putting out um, there that um, researchers can uh, look at. So the number of followers of uh, this person, number of friends they have is there. This person has their time zone and their geolocation um, you know, to where they are. Um, you know, uh, down to sort of 10 meter uh, location, uh, to 10 meter accuracy. So we have that, um, we have 200 million of those um, per day. Um, and so you can imagine there is a lot of compute um, that is going on under the hood uh, to analyze this, um, to reduce this data down to something that we can analyze and just calculate a mean on. Um, so yeah, there are these deep computational aspects. Uh, here's a study that I did, as, you know, it illustrates this, this is just, um, I think this is 11 million uh, of these tweets uh, from 2011. Um, and these are just the ones uh, that at the time were geolocated. So where somebody had posted it from a mobile phone and opted to share their location um, you know, of the United States. So um, uh, they're colored uh, by, by this sentiment, by this happiness. So red is happy and blue is sad. So the South turned out to be um, sad for various reasons that you can ask me about uh, near the beach. Turned out to be uh, turned out to be happy for um, other reasons that made sense. The worrying thing is that you can see freeways here, so you know um, hopefully people are pulling to the side of the road um, for their tweeting, um, but we didn't stop and ask them. So and you can imagine, I like to show this figure because there was a hell of a lot of compute to make this um, uh, uh, to make this picture. Um, yeah, and it's you know there was lots and lots of things that we could um, that we could learn from this. And I could talk I could talk for the rest of this talk about. Um, the geography of happiness in the United States and um, all over the place, but I, I, I want to move on. The human aspects of this study um, is, as you can imagine, you know, once you have a tool like this and once you have a large and interesting data set um, that can tell you something about people, um, it leads to a bunch of different collaborations. So I've been very, very lucky um, to work with um, psychologists, so with domain, exp uh, domain experts in a range of different domains. Um, so looking at body image, uh, looking at um, discussion around uh, climate change uh, online. You know, some of this we've done uh, tiny bits of um, uh, 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 disease modeling um, and uh, uh, looking at uh, attitudes around food uh, and things like this. There's an ecological aspect. 
Um, mis and disinformation um, is a big topic at the moment. Um, so we've, uh, um, we do have some number of collaborations going on, uh, going on there. Um, so there are human aspects and there have been domain aspects and it's been a real privilege to um, work with all of these different people. I have to give you one brag um, very quickly. You know, the nicest human aspect uh, of this study has been the time that I made um, uh, a little Raspberry Pi with a light on it um, that, uh, uh, that monitored Twitter for Australian geolocated tweets, so uh, tweets that people have written within Australia, uh, and then it changed colour based on how happy or sad those tweets were. So I had this you know, real-time uh, little uh, piece of installation art on my desk here um, that flashed lights and was a good conversation starter with students. Um, that led to, happily for me, um, you know, this Museum of Discovery um, uh, here in Adelaide um, was having a, happened to be having an exhibition called Hedonism, which was very fortuitous. Um, and I happened to meet someone who was organizing this ex uh, exhibition. Um, and I said, that's cool. Um, can we make a big one? Um, so they made a big one of my little orb. Um, and this was a piece of installation art as part of the, um, part of the exhibit um, yeah, for, um, for six months or so. So that was, a, um, that was an amazing experience. Um, to work with artists and installation artists, um, I can talk about um, different colours and um, you know, the, the um, difficulties that we had in choosing colours for this orb. Um, so I've learned a lot um, through that experience. Okay, so that's an example of a pure data science project, uh, right? Like there's, it, there's interesting data in that. There's statistics. Uh, in that very simple statistics, um, you know, you could talk about more complicated statistical methods. Um, there's a lot of compute uh, in it, and there's a lot of applications to different domains. So that's data science, um, right? And it's pretty, um, pretty enjoyable piece of data science. Um, I want to come back to the plan. Okay, we're halfway through this talk. Um, we want to uh, shift gears a little bit uh, and talk about uh, applied mathematics. Um, but before I do, you know, let me just um, talk briefly about data science, where it currently is at, I think, in Australia, um, and where it's hopefully going to uh, be going over the next few years. Um, some of you will have seen uh, this report uh, from late last year from the Australian Academy uh, of Science um, on data intensive research uh, in Australia. And to me, this is really a kind of a call to arms for academic data science um, in Australia. It's, it has a, um, a fantastic chapter. Um, that I've sort of stolen a little bit from um, for this talk uh, about the history of data science um, and data science in Australia that's well worth reading, it's very readable. Um, and importantly, it makes a series of recommendations um, to the academic community and to the Australian government and um, to various organisations over here on the right um, around data science and around other data-driven um, uh, 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 data disciplines. So I'll pick out a few of these. Um, I'm only picking out a handful, I should say. Uh, there are recommendations uh, in this as well around establishing data science centers uh, in universities across Australia, um, creating a data science society, like we have this society for applied mathematics, uh, mapping Australia's um, capability uh, in data science and related disciplines. I'm um, and addressing gender imbalance, uh, which is really important because data science, like um, so many other disciplines, including uh, our own, I guess, has um, you know has these uh, has these gender imbalances that we want to uh, that we want to try and correct. So, but the, uh, the the handful of recommendations I want to focus on are one about establishing data science as a discipline, right? So, recognizing um, that data science is its own scientific discipline alongside others creating a field of research code, an FOR code, which would be um, great for me <laughs> personally, so I know where that, so I know how to fill that section out uh, on my uh, um, on my ARC applications, uh, and strengthening, you know, through various different schemes, uh, establishing um, uh, various different schemes for strengthening Australian research and foundational data science. Um, so data science is at this cusp, um, I think, in Australia of becoming its own, uh, of becoming a discipline um, and, uh, 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 and really uh, being defined. Um, you know, that's important um, for um, us to know in applied mathematics. And the question for us, the discussion question that we'd be having hopefully over, uh, over afternoon tea, if we were already person, is how should we respond? Uh, how, um, what should we uh, do uh, here in applied mathematics? So, you know, all of these questions are going towards, uh, uh, are getting at the question of really, trying to really get at what is data science, um, define, it's, it's challenging us to define what it is, 
um, to sort of manifest it um, yeah, and, uh, and establish it as a discipline. So here's what I want to say about applied mathematics. Here's the thing um, is that we've been here before, right? Um, this has happened, uh, this has happened before. And in fact, um, you know, it has happened in applied mathematics um, over, the, uh, over the lifetimes uh, of some of us. Um, we've had this debate about what is applied mathematics. Um, you know, AF Pillow, um, you know, some of you will recognize the, um, uh, the name as uh, being a very prominent Australian applied mathematician um, and uh, having a named uh, postgrad scholarship named after him. So Pillow has given this talk about applied mathematics and it's amazing to read because if you substitute data science for applied mathematics, then what he is saying in 1965 about applied math um, translates to everything, you know, almost verbatim to everything that I've just said. So in fact, you know, it's, here are some of the questions, here are some quotes uh, uh, from, the, from the lecture. Do we need applied, an applied mathematician? He, you know, he says, uh, is, applied math, uh, is applied mathematics an independent discipline uh, of its own? Um, he sort of answers this question, of course, and says, you know, like, much like data science, applied mathematics lies between the sciences. And it is an attitude, it's an approach, uh, it's a way of thinking. And these are things that we could map onto data science as well. Um, Pillow's answer to the question, um, I'm sure that many of us will uh, agree with, you know, he um, uh, establishes that uh, he concludes that uh, applied mathematics is an independent scientific discipline, which first seeks to construct idealized mathematical models uh, in science and engineering by successive syntheses, and then aims by deductive analysis of those models to harness nature and gain a richer understanding of it. Compare that with the, um, the PNAS uh, article on data science and science that I talked about five minutes ago. You know, we've been here before. Um, applied mathematics has gone through the same discussion um, as data science has. That's a really um, important point, I think. While I'm talking about um, applied mathematics, let's flash forward to the present uh, and get a perspective um, on what applied mathematics is now. This is important if we're talking about uh, data science uh, and applied mathematics. Um, so Wine and E is a, uh, is a pure mathem mathematician and this is from the notices of the AMS. Um, you know, firstly, the nice thing is, uh, the nice thing that Wine and E says in this um, article is that applied mathematics uh, is a mature scientific discipline. So applied mathematics certainly exists and nobody would um, debate that at the moment. And here are the features um, that uh, Wine and E uh, uh, says are, um, are the features of modern applied mathematics. So, you know, the first is first principle based modeling. So by that he, he, he says means what we'd call um, traditional sort of physical modeling, applied, math, uh, applied mathematics, PDEs based, uh, physical laws based um, applied mathematical modeling. That's number one. Second, data-driven methods. By that he says he's explicitly means machine learning. Uh, he means stats and he means data processing, like image processing and things like this. So data science, data analytics skills, uh, and then algorithms. So, um, you know, if I look at this, I, I kind of think, well, if that's what modern applied mathematics is, I guess I'm just an applied mathematician uh, these days, but you know, because I sort of do all of those, um, but only just. And so that's, you know, that's interesting um, to me as well. So in all of this, you know, we're starting to um, think in everything I'm saying, you know, is applied mathematics just data science? Are these the same thing? <laughs> and to, uh, to, to give a bit more here, um, you know, data to decision CRC, there's a CRC that I, I'm based out of Adelaide that I worked with um, uh, a, a, a few years ago. One of the things they produced was this data science competency framework where this was pitched at businesses and it was talking about, um, you know, how, how do you distinguish data scientists from data analysts and data engineers, these sort of industry um, jobs that people have. So they had this chart of all the different um, uh, attributes that data scientists versus data analysts and data engineers uh, need to have. Um, and what's the one thing that distinguishes a data scientist? Um, it's modeling out of everything on that table um, according to this, the thing that is unique about data science compared to the other data-driven disciplines is modeling. We're all modelers. This community is modelers. <laughs> Does that mean that we're, are we all data scientists? 
Um, there's a uh, there's a discussion question for over um, uh, over uh, uh, afternoon tea, uh, I guess. You know, to be clear, they're talking about statistical modeling here. They do make reference. They do talk about mathematical models um, as part of this. They're largely talking about statistical modeling, but there's an opportunity um, for modeling to be fully integrated uh, uh, within this new discipline of data science. One last Venn diagram. Um, you know, the, the answer to the question um, from the past slide, I don't think applied mathematics uh, and data science are exactly the same, and I'll uh, tease them out in uh, the example that I'm going to conclude with. But you know, here's my stab at a Venn diagram, a modern Venn diagram for um, uh, data science and applied mathematics. Um, you know, we get asked the question all the time about how AI and machine learning are different from data science. I think that data science is much more you know, just the, um, uh, the idea about modeling um, makes data science much more um, than just machine learning uh, or AI. Um, and I think that applied mathematics has a lot of overlap. You know, we could get into trouble here. You could uh, put different disciplines, different sub-disciplines of applied mathematics and try and figure out where they fit um, on this. But I think there is, there is a lot of overlap and that's something for us to embrace. But you know, these, these are not completely overlapping uh, circles here. And I wanna conclude with an example, a little science example, a uh, research example uh, from my own work about where I think um, uh, the distinctions lay, where the, the subtle um, uh, differences lie. And I hope um, how these two disciplines can sort of help each other out. So here's a piece of data science research um, uh, that I've been working on uh, for some years now with my colleague, um, my collaborator, uh, Jim Bagro from the University of Vermont, and that's continuing on now. Um, being interested in social media, um, we had this data science type question, um, you know, which is to what extent um, is my online activity predicted by my friends? So if I can see the tweets or the posts um, of my friends, if I can gather all of those, um, but I'm sort of hidden, I delete my account or whatever, uh, how much of an inference can you make about me uh, from my friends? So how much of the future of this ego uh, can you predict from the past of these alters to use that sort of social science language? So there's a data science uh, way to answer to this, uh, way to answer this question. You know, a, um, an obvious thing might be to just say, well, I've got things I want to predict. I've got data um, from friends that I want to use to predict it. Why don't I just build a machine learning model? Let's deep learn um, you know, these future posts based on um, previous posts, chuck it into the neural network. Um, away we go measure the accuracy boom. You have a, you've got a number. Um, cool. you know, that would be fine as an approach. We're kind of both applied mathematicians. So we took a, um, a, you know, a much, a, what I think is a bit more of a nuanced um, applied math inspired um, approach. We just to um, say, we're talking about information here. You know, how much information uh, of my online information in these tweets here can be, uh, is represented in the information of these. So, you know, I can measure across entropy between these, um, between these groups. And there's, you know, there are ways to estimate this in a non-parametric way, which I won't talk about. So we looked at how much, um, if, I, if I, you know, looked at how much information was in a, a population uh, of Twitter users, I've um, got this blue histogram here and then looked at how much information, uh, how much of that could be predicted um, from these alters. You see that there was some overlap here, but you made some errors, of course. Um, uh, and so these distributions don't entirely overlap. We could convert this uh, through Fano's inequality through some information theoretic results uh, to a measure of predictability. Um, and you see that uh, as we add more and more friends, so as you observe more and more friends, um, you get closer and closer to being able to make as good a prediction as if you were reading uh, the individual's tweets themselves. There's a, you know, there's a cool conclusion to this paper was that once you have the data from eight to nine friends, um, then that captures 95% uh, you know, uh, of the, uh, the, the individual's potential predictive accuracy. So the, in principle, you could uh, create a machine learning model which could um, predict 95% um, of the information that you could get from uh, from, a unit, uh, uh, from a user themselves. And that's independent of a machine learning algorithm. So that was a nice fundamental result. So we could have stopped there, um, but you know, we started to look at things like social networks, these information flows between individuals in networks. 
Um, we started to look at, think about different questions. We wanted to look at uh, uh, individuals with different vocabulary sizes in different languages and things like this. And, you know, we, we ran up against this question of interpretation, right? Like just getting these numbers um, is not that um, useful uh, all the time. You want to be able to interpret uh, these values um, and, to, uh, and to have a sandpit to play it. You know, I want to be able to control inputs to outputs. If I have users of a certain type, if I can create those, um, then, then how does this information flow measure work, right? If I have a particular type of social network, if I want to explore um, different types of social networks, how does information propagate? What is the uh, information flows? Uh, what do they look like in those, in those networks? So we found that we needed to do some modeling, right? You know, the, the flashy statistic was, um, that was fine, um, but we couldn't really understand what all of this meant unless we could compare it um, with a sort of controlled experiment. You know, this is, I haven't told you any of the details of this study, but it was all observational. You know, this is all just looking at data and coming up with a cool metric and applying it. And that's sort of, um, you know, somehow unsatisfying. So applied math comes in. Um, so what we needed was a model uh, for how people uh, uh, write um, online. Um, and how people uh, generate and share information online. And so we came up with this thing called a quota model uh, where people uh, write simulated text uh, with some properties that are somewhat realistic. Um, and it becomes a stochastic model. We embed them in a social network, which, you, which we can create um, and then have some generative model um, for the dynamics of this information generation and propagation. Different to um, uh, you know, a contagion type model, um, we're actually generating words here uh, and passing those around. And now we could start to really learn some stuff. Um, so we could look at you know, fundamental structures uh, in networks, forks, colliders, triangles, uh, things like this, and look at if we varied the, um, the probability of quoting uh, between individuals in a controlled manner, um, how much information, you know, how these structures actually related to information flow. And none of that we were going to get um, from doing the observational study from the pure data science. Um, this allowed us to sort of calibrate uh, how, um, you know, how these information flows work and you know, try to explain and interpret uh, where certain types of patterns were coming from. Um, you know, there were other results that came along with this. Um, we could apply this in different um, we could apply this model to different real networks uh, and look at the density of networks. So how many, uh, how clustered people are, how that inhibits information flow. I won't say anything about this. We found that density, you know, the more, um, more echo chambery, more densely clustered um, a network was like, uh, network was that actually inhibited um, information flow. Um, and interestingly, this turned out to be a bit, little bit like um, uh, these famous complex contagion models. So we could start to relate this to different social networks, um, uh, structures, uh, and different types of contagion dynamics. So um, this, this led to some sort of interesting insights, I think, uh, in this field of complex, uh, complex networks um, and complex systems. Um, so it started off as a data, pure data science project, um, again, but you know, the applied mathematical perspective, that modeling perspective, um, actually really helped us understand what was going on and it sort of um, took the research in a new direction. Okay, so there's much more to say about um, that information flow I'm really um, passionate about. We have lots of projects um, going on, so I will abuse my uh, power here in the second last slide um, and tell you that you should go and see Bridget Smart's um, uh, talk tomorrow afternoon uh, in Quokka. She's talking about, amongst other things, the application of some of these information flow techniques to coordinated activity in social media. So if you have um, uh, you know, a malicious entity group who's trying to spread uh, misinformation uh, in a social network, uh, the, you know, these information flow uh, techniques um, seem to give us um, uh, nice ways of detecting that um, and hopefully countering it. It's another great example um, of how there's a strong data-driven component to it you know, there are real, um, there's real data that we should look at there and that we can learn things from, but we can't understand whether the stuff that we're seeing is real or not without, um, you know, the modeling, the digital twin um, sort of idea um, and without the um, applied mathematical modeling perspective. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, I'm going to stop here um, with some final thoughts. Um, so zooming back up again. Um, what do I want to say uh, about data science? Well, firstly, 
it is a discipline, um, you know, even if the, uh, uh, just as um, applied mathematics um, has gone through this, um, you know, when, uh, when, when Pillow was talking about applied mathematics in 1965, applied mathematics was a discipline, um, and he was just uh, talking about why we should recognize it like that. I think we are at the same point um, with data science and hopefully the parallels between 1965 and now have pretty, been pretty clear through this talk. Um, we don't need to need fear um, data science, um, partly for a range of reasons. Um, part of the reason is that I think data science is distinct from applied mathematics. You know, they, they have a lot in common, but they are not exactly the same. You know, the mathematical modeling that we did in that last section and um, this quota model is mathematical modeling. That's applied mathematics. Um, it is distinct. Um, uh, we could ask different sorts of questions. We could do different sorts of things what we would do in traditional data science. So um, it's the, the disciplines are distinct, but with a lot of overlap and with a lot to help each other um, with. Hopefully that, um, that last example kind of illustrates that. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm increasingly convinced um, of this final point uh, which is that data science really needs applied mathematical uh, expertise. You know, um, in Australia over the last few years, data science has been uh, sort of claimed and owned by um, uh, by computer science to large uh, to large extent. I think, and I see there's a real opportunity and there's a real need um, uh, for applied mathematicians to get involved and to bring the um, uh, bring the perspectives that we have as modelers and people who understand this process of limitations of models um, uh, in uh, uh, limitations of models and assumptions um, and communication and working in different domains um, and all of these aspects that's needed in applied mathematics uh, uh, that's that's needed um, in data science um, yeah you know the one of, for many reasons including for if we want data science to be trustworthy uh, want it to be interpretable um, it requires the types of skills um, that this community has. Um, so yeah, I think it's a it's an exciting time um, uh, to be in data science uh, and to be in applied mathematics. Um, and I hope that there's going to be a lot of cross fertilization between the two disciplines. Um, that's it. That's my talk. I'll stop sharing my slides and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. An excellent talk. Um, so I have my eyes to everybody. I'm seeing lots of uh, applause. I have my eyes on the question and answer. Um, so I'll take the first uh, question. It was interesting to me on your first um, example in your data that there's peaks in happiness annually at mm. Christmas time that mm. seem to be about the same height as mm. the, the sadness that people feel in quite major events. Is it the case that um, the happiness side of things tends to be higher than the sadness or is it? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I think so. I mean, the last two years has thrown everything um, uh, out. Last two years have been very strange if you go and look at the website. Um, yeah, I mean, all of these don't take the actual numbers themselves too seriously. It's a sort of a very relative measure. Um, yeah, and you're looking for sort of the trends um, in this in this thing. One thing that I'll say is that what's really, really interesting um, about uh, the you know, point that you've identified uh, there is the peaks in happiness tend to be almost totally deterministic, right? They're completely predictable. It's Christmas Day, it's Mother's Day, it's New Year's Day. Um, you know, the only sort of surprising things are when a Korean pop star has a birthday or something, you'll see peaks then um, uh, because there's a big, turns out there's a big K-pop um, community on Twitter. The dips, the troughs, the sadness, um, the dips in sadness are much more interesting. You know, they're, they're much more random. Um, they're much, there's much more information um, contained in those in a lot of ways. So yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting thing that, um, yeah, is, uh, is very, it's very much the, um, the happy families are all alike. The sad families are, because uh, it's, it's sad in their own ways to bastardize that quote. Um, yeah. well, we know when we're expected to be happy. So we've got a question from um, Scott McHugh on the chat. The type of mathematical modeling that Fenton Pillow refers to in 1965 relates more to fluid mechanics and heat convection than information flow and Twitter. Do you think those of us who still dabble in these classical topics are about to go extinct? Um, are we not sexy enough for the 2020s? That's the fear. Well, firstly, um, Scott, you will always be sexy. Um, so don't worry about that, um, Scott. Um, 
uh, that's the fear, isn't it? Like that's the, that's what I hear all the time. You know, um, the other thing to say is like, I hope not. Um, I don't think that, you know, there's, there's something, there is something bubblish about um, uh, uh, social media research and, uh, and this sort of stuff. You know, the internet for various reasons is not going to look the same um, in, uh, in 10 years, or, uh, 10 or 20 years time as it looks now. And, and my ability to do social media research is going to be uh, very different. So I hope that these things um, uh, are not becoming extinct because I want to have something to go back to. <laughs> Uh, because I want to dabble in these, to continue to dabble in these things as well. Look, um, no, I think the answer is, uh, I, I think the answer is no. Um, all the while this community exists and all the while there are open problems um, and um, there is a reason to do fluid dynamics, which there absolutely is, um, it's going to, uh, it's going to persist. My point is just that um, I'd like to, um, uh, see some of those skills and some of that um, way of thinking applied into data science. Like data science um, needs um, you know, the traditional applied mathematics way of thinking, possibly more um, in many ways than the other way around. Um, yeah, that's my comment there. Cool. And we have a, uh, another question from Bronwyn Hayek with a, a, comes with a wink. Is Wordle a happy or a sad word? Wordle's not in the dictionary because Wordle didn't exist um, when the dictionary was made. So I don't know, we should update it. Um, yeah, I, I've, as well as you've been, if you've been watching my Twitter, you see that I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in Wordle and I'm um, uh, hoping to do a, get back to, I'm analyzing some of these millions of tweets now I've collected uh, over the past couple of months. <laughs> Uh, about Wordle, there's a whole bunch of interesting problems there that I think that we could look at. So yeah, Wordle's uh, interesting to me too. It's partly because partly for the disease aspect, the virality aspect. Partly there's interesting questions in what you can learn about people's problem solving ability and stuff from actually what they post. Um, yeah, I want to do a lot more with that. So um, we're getting quite a few questions in now, but we we have time for maybe one or two more before people have to get on to their next talks at ten two. Um, so uh, I'll try to save those so that you can uh, have chats about them later. But um, from Samson Ting, this might be a naive question. Do you see data-driven models as mostly synonymous as machine learning models? If data-driven models is a, are a superset of machine learnings, what exactly distinguishes them? Yeah, good question. Um, look, I'd like to take a broader, I'd like to take uh, to try and take a broader definition um, of data-driven models uh, than just machine learning models. That will be really limiting um, to the field if data-driven modeling um, becomes just machine learning. Um, I think this is a conversation for the community to have, right? Like um, uh, it, it would be nice to see um, more applied mathematical modeling, which is data-driven um, in a, you know, a very deep sense. Um, that brought into the discussion um, uh, of data science modeling and of you know the types of approaches that can that is, that machine learning models are currently being um, thrown at. So let's you know let me turn that around and give that um, as a as a challenge to um, the community is let's make data driven modeling uh, mean something more um, than just than just machine learning. You know um, that's the opportunity that um, that I think we have. And, yeah. That's what I think we should go and do. Thank you. Uh, we'll leave it on that, the questions. I have taken a screenshot so I can forward them to you. So if <laughs> you can't see them. Um, so um, thank you again, Lois, for a wonderful talk and congratulations on your um, Mitchell Medal from last year. Um, and just uh, we'll give uh, Lois another round of applause virtually. I don't know if you can see them, but um, they come up somewhere here on my screen. Um, and we have roughly seven minutes to make it through the little um, maze to our um, next sessions. And hopefully everybody enjoys your afternoon or evening for uh, some of us. Thanks, everyone.